Hello and welcome to the Modern Adventurer podcast coming up. There's a Werner Herzog, the, the Austrian filmmaker, there's a, there's a quote by him I quite like, which is, uh, tourism is sin, traveling on foot is virtue. And what he sort of means by that, or what I take him to mean by that, is can be like voyeuristic. And it, it, what I mean is you could, you are not actually engaged, you're just looking at. It's like you go to a zoo, um, there's no vulnerability on your part, you're not actually immersed in that situation. Whereas if you do something like cycle or walk through a landscape, um, anyone can st stop you, ask what you're doing, ask where you're going, have a conversation with you. It's not like you're, you know, you're not in any way separate. And the most extreme form of that is obviously walking. Um, so I was really interested in, in walking because at a walking pace, you will have to engage with people. On today's show, we have Ollie Broadhead, an explorer with an absolutely incredible story to tell. From cycling up Norway to the Arctic Circle, walking across India, he has covered a wide range of expeditions. And on today's podcast, we are talking about some of those. We go into detail about his fascinating trip in Sumatra and some of the amazing wildlife he discovered out there. So I am delighted to introduce Ollie Broadhead to the show. Cheers. Right. It's unbelievable some of the trips you've done and I was really fascinated to sort of get down to sort of details about how you sort of started and some of your trips, especially in India. Um, we had Iris, who you know very well, on quite a few weeks back and she was talking about the story of Sumatra, which I'm sure you have other stories as well to tell. But before we jump into that, um, let's find out a bit more about you and how you got into all these sort of adventures. Um, I grew up in rural Cornwall. Um, so it's always been, you know, nature on my doorstep. I've been extremely lucky with that and the sea as well, actually. So I've always uh, really, as far back as I can remember, I've been certainly free diving and sea kayaking. Um, and then other things like, you know, climbing and all that came later. And I think, you know, initially, like I think a huge number of people in the UK, I wanted to be David Attenborough when I was about, you know, six. Um, so I was always off foraging for bugs, foraging for frogs, all that sort of stuff. Um, but I think one of the things that definitely I would say at that age, you could possibly already noticed, I was really obsessed with, with sort of the, the longer, uh, the long the longer adventure the more immersive sort of thing so you know what i mean by that is um i would much rather uh rather i'd much rather stay out overnight even when i was that old i remember when i was like about eight years old uh for my i think it was my eighth birthday actually and, and like my birthday wish was that um i could go camping by myself uh because because i'd read somewhere that like the legal age of being able to camp alone was like 14 and i remember my dad just being like you know well, go on then. <laughs> just like that night out in the, out in the wood, and I think it's been the same with with almost everything. With like, I haven't been content to, um, uh, you know, to do a sport like to go kayaking or to or to go, um, you know, even to, even to like go and uh, free dive with seals or something. I would so much rather spend you know a day on an island or or camp overnight or you know stay out longer. Um, and that was something I was always doing. I was always trying to do like multi-day little treks down streams, even when I was about, you know, 11 or 12, I think that's been really consistent. And then... Uh, I think we all want to be David Attenborough. Yeah. Attenborough. <laughs> <laughs> it's sad as you, as you just grow up, you just realise it's a bit unrealistic, but you, you all start aiming high, don't you? Um, and then I, you know, and then that just sort of evolved. I think the first thing I did was when I was... Well, I mean, I, I traveled quite a bit. I, I'd always traveled. Luckily, again, my, my parents had worked abroad um, and we traveled a bit with them. I traveled quite a lot with them, actually, growing up. So it was never like um, that being an issue. It was, but as, a, yeah, first year at university was like my first um, proper adventure, I guess, um, which was I, I basically had no money as first year student. You don't. And I was just trying to think of something I could do for 
effectively no money and with no planning because I was sort of coming up with this idea whilst my exams were coming up and I decided to uh, I had a mate in Norway a mate who lived in Oslo he said he'd lend me a bike um, I decided I'd cycle to the Arctic Circle uh, because you just have to aim north it's very simple navigation you take a compass you don't need a map and and that was about it I mean you can you, I mean as, as bad as it is for the environment um, and I do think about that a lot more you know you can you could get a flight to Oslo for I don't know, like twenty quid or something. So it, even in even in Norway, and then obviously Norway is a very expensive country. So I had this uh, slightly bonkers diet because I think I budgeted about five pounds a day for a month uh, cycling. And what I could get for that in Norway was two bananas, half a loaf of bread, and half a bar of chocolate a day. So I lost about ten or twelve kilograms over that that month long period. Um, and as many muscles as I could find. Luckily, I, I stuck to the coast. There's this gorgeous coast road um, that goes all the way up from Bergen in the south, which is where all the fjords and mountains are, and then it goes all the way up to the Arctic. And you can sort of follow it, um, follow it along through all these sort of coastal pine forests. And it's a, it's a small road. It's a, it's nice, nice like, like single single lane road. And um, so yeah, as much as many shellfish as I could forage, and I had like this one tube of tomato paste I'd got from Lidl before I left. So I was sort of squirting that onto, you know, very sparingly. I think I made it last about three weeks. Um, and yeah, I mean, I managed it. So that was, a, that was a huge confidence boost. Not without, not without some um, wobbles along the way, because it, it, it was June. I think I actually cycled through the summer solstice. Um, but being Norway, it rained all but two days. And I mean, freezing rain. And, you know, minus five degrees at night. So it was properly grim. And um, I had a few wobbles. It was certainly the longest I'd been... There's the thing you don't think about. Uh, obviously, I was solo for that. And I sort of suddenly realised after like a week of sort of basically not speaking to anyone that this was definitely by far the longest I'd ever gone without sort of communicating with a human, you know, because I was, I was, you know, occasionally passing. It's quite rural. So you're maybe passing. Lots of people live in cities in Norway. So actually, when you get into the countryside, there's, there's sort of people's summer houses, potentially, you know, little fishing lodges and stuff. But they're quite often deserted. Um, so I did start to go a bit mad. Uh, I remember at one point sort of really quite seriously believing I was being chased by um, trolls, sort of like I could sort of feel shadows moving outside my tent and I was being really quite, you know, panicky when I was when I was having my back to anything, like collecting water. Uh, when you've got to like do that proper, I guess it's a proper animal instinct, isn't it? It's, you know, your your head's bent, you're looking at the stream. It's the perfect time when something gets you from behind if you're a little gazelle or something so yeah i mean i had a had a few little um well was but i mean i made it and it was actually amazing it was possibly the possibly still one of the best days of my life was uh, for all the right reasons was arriving in the arctic because we had um like absolute howling wind and rain and gnarliness coming on shore right on the coast like the co the road was three meters from the sea so you have waves splashing up i was absolutely drenched freezing and then as soon as I got actually to the Arctic, at about 10 that evening, the sky just opened, completely clear, beautiful sunset. And obviously it's the midnight sun. And I had the midnight sun in the Arctic for like the three days I was there. Um, climbed up a few mountains. Uh, it was absolutely... And, and thus I was camped just on the edge of this fjord that just dropped completely crystal clear water. So going down like 15 or so metres, you could see straight down and then this ledge and then this drop into the absolute abyss and you have these codfish coming up coming up from the depths and sort of going on this ledge and this ledge was just littered uh, with starfish and sea urchins but huge they've got starfish the size of car tires there these amazing colors like purple and orange um, and sort of plunging into that and then getting out and seriously regretting it because it was so bloody cold but it was no that was it was definitely a this that sort of enforced it was probably the right decision and i did hugely enjoy it um which is obviously sort of why i started planning more ambitious things after that but that was definitely the the thing that got me started i think were you much of a cyclist before you did that oh god no yeah <laughs> i should have said i should have led with that um so i pretty much i mean i live in hilly laney cornwall um and cycling is a bit sketchy around here at the best of times we've got the hedges outside my house are about the height of a double decker bus so it's very much a a blind uh prayer if you're if you're taking a corner on a bike so i've pretty much never cycled um um you know all my mates can attest to that that i'm actually a laughing stock on a bike and 
Yeah, I'd, and I had no real fitness for cycling, for cycling certainly when I when I set off. So I don't. I just sort of made it work. I, the first day, I was like, okay, I'll get 100k done, and I did. I did about 110k, and then the next day, I couldn't walk pretty much. I was just hobbling along. I did, probably, I did about 10k. Um, it was it was really not. I I just remember thinking on you know. Bloody hell! If I was gonna if I was gonna, <laughs> gonna learn to cycle across a country, I should have I should have chosen the Netherlands. You know, I should have chosen a flat country. <laughs> you know, first few weeks were just mountains. Anyway, yeah, I mean, I I survived it. So obviously learned a bit. Forgot it all immediately after. Still can't cycle. I think it was day three where when I was doing across America, and day three was the killer. And you'd sort of walk into supermarkets and your legs would feel like jelly, like you were about to keel over. Even though like your mind was very normal and your body was, your legs were just like, would just give way. And, and then it, it sort of took about, what, a week or two before it sort of caught up with it, because you're doing it every day, I imagine. Yeah, yeah, no, I think, yeah, a couple of weeks will get you into anything, I think. It's amaz- it is amazing uh, what your body can adapt to uh, fairly quickly, as long as you don't get too injured. Yeah, no, I, I finished fairly injury-free. I mean, I mean, I'm intrigued to imagine what these trolls that were chasing you were like. Oh, yeah. In your mind. Quite bear-like. <laughs> Bears covered in moss, I think. Uh, definitely, I mean, there was, there was, seriously, there was at one point where um, I was setting up my tent and a tree collapsed behind me or a big branch came off a tree and i you know pretty much jumped out my skin i was so certain it was this i don't know if you've seen the film troll hunter but it's a brilliant brilliant norwegian film and i think i'd i'd watched that a bit too recently and it is it's the whole theme is that trolls are real and the norwegian government's been covering them up and they occasionally come out and eat people It's sort of Blair Witch Project style. It's very funny. It's very funny. Like, like watching Hostel before you go backpacking. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's certain things you just shouldn't do. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why mess with your mind? Why mess with it? Yeah. Always makes for a more exciting trip. So after that, you were absolutely hooked, and I suppose you went back to uni, and you were pretty much planning the next one. Yes, I was. I I was. I think the. What I found was, I mean, I, I, I know it sounds weird, I really, really like people. I'm more interested in people, I know it sounds silly, like more interested in people than nature, but there's, there's that crossover, um, you know, like Norway, you are staring at a mountain in the distance for a whole day, and it's the same mountain. It's a big, what I mean is it's a big landscape. It's big, wide open, you know, big, not on a human scale at all. And... Um, you're obviously spending a lot of time just thinking on a bike, <laughs> 14 kilometers uphill. It's a lot of time to think. And um, so I was really interested to go somewhere where there were more people. And I was really interested. I really, uh, I, as a Werner Herzog, the, the Austrian filmmaker, there's a, there's a quote by him I quite like, which is, uh, tourism is sin, traveling on foot is virtue. And what he sort of means by that, or what I take him to mean by that is, quite often tourism can be like voyeuristic and it, what I mean is you could you are not actually engaged you're just looking at it's like you go to a zoo um there's no vulnerability on your part you're not actually immersed in that situation whereas if you do something like cycle or walk through a landscape um anyone can s- stop you ask what you're doing ask where you're going have a conversation with you it's not like you're you know you're not in any way separate and the most extreme form of that is obviously walking um so i was really interested in in walking because at a walking pace you will have to engage with people and you are forced to slow down you you won't miss stuff in the same way it's you know if you you know you could go out and look at a hedgerow and you could cycle down that lane and see nothing or you could walk and be observant and see a thousand things so i was really interested to do a long walk and uh india was a country i've been to with my parents um before and i know i absolutely loved and i knew it was absolute madness um it's a bonkers and it's quite wonderful country and so i was looking for something that i could do and i had the time constraint uh all my time constraints at the time were what could I do in a summer holiday from uni? So three months. Um, so how far could I walk in three months? And I thought I could probably walk the length of the Kaveri. And the Kaveri is one of the seven holy rivers in India. It's the southernmost of the great sacred rivers of India. And what's cool about it is um, 
it cuts basically the whole, it's a bit weird, it cuts the whole way across the country. It starts on the, on the west coast, about 20 kilometres, very close to the west coast, maybe 40. And instead of just logically flowing to the west coast, it goes, oh no, I'm going the other way. And it flows all the way, hundreds and hundreds of kilometres, all the way across the east coast. Um, so if you start on the east coast, you can follow it all the way up to its source, and you can basically do the whole country following a river. And I think you can see a theme here, which is I really don't like navigating, or at the time I certainly didn't. So it was very simple. Again, take a compass, start and go, go west, and you'll, you'll get where you need to go eventually. Um, uh, so it was, yeah, it was the same sort of thing in terms of the, the simple navigation and the, and the times just worked. So that was, that was, became my next project. And uh, so what was it, so sort of planning that project, what was the route from India? Uh, okay, so in terms of the states, so it's the, the most southern states. So you've got uh, on the east coast, I'm going to try and get this right. On the east coast, you've got Tamil Nadu, middle you've got Karnataka, and then you end in Kerala. Um, the slightly bonkers thing is about uh, Indian states, you know, you can't think UK counties think much more American states. I mean, I think Tamil Nadu alone has a population higher than the whole of the UK. It's, it's like 75 million people. Uh, so they're vast and they have, they have their own languages as well. So each of those, uh, Tamil Nadu, they speak Tamil, Karnataka, they speak uh, Canada. Uh, I'm gonna be really dim and I've completely forgotten what they speak in Kerala. So it's, you're, you're going through three, almost like three countries in terms, of, in terms of the language, but also in terms of the culture, the his, history. Historically, they would have been independent. Um, so it's, it's an amazing journey in terms of the diversity of it. And also in terms of the geography. So uh, T Tamil Nadu, when we were there, was at the end of a horrendous drought, a four year drought. And it ended, actually that drought ended just after we finished, but not in a good way. They had some like the worst flooding in a hundred years. And it was bonkers actually. We, were, we, we stayed with some students after we had finished this walk. And um, their whole uh, like house was flooded out rats and snakes in the kitchen, all this kind of stuff, really bad, uh, just after we left. Uh, but when we started, it was boiling hot. I mean, like over 40 degrees in the day, everything was effectively a desert, you know, walking through crop fields that were just dust, proper grim dust bowl um, for weeks, weeks and weeks, uh, not a single cloud in the sky. Um, and I got, I got actually, it was very stupid. I mean, you things to be aware of when you go to a country that you just never think of in the UK are heat stroke. And I got heat sick once and then heat stroke, proper heat stroke where I was really bad. Um, I, I probably, so I'd, I was actually, I was with a guy and there was a, there's an interesting story actually to how I, well, not an interesting story, but there's a story to how I ended up going with someone. I was going to do it solo. Uh, and then about a month before I was gonna actually set off, I freaked out and I thought, you know, this is, <laughs> this is a bloody long way to go solo. This isn't quite Norway. Uh, maybe I should go with someone. And I sort of advertised uh, on Facebook saying, does anyone want to go walk across India? It'll cost about this much. Again, it was insanely cheap. I think the whole thing costs under 700 quid or something. And um, we, and I got a lot of, I got loads of responses, but it was mainly from people way older and more experienced than myself. Uh, so, and at the time I didn't really want to hand over you know who's in charge because it was my it was my thing that I wanted to do and I didn't want to go with someone who'd be saying we're going here and going there and there was a guy in the year below at uni who I'd never met uh, also studying biology um, who said yeah I'd, uh, I'd go and we met once I think before we actually met at the airport um, so it was a bit bonkers and he was putting a lot more trust in me than I was putting in him because I'd been to India before and he'd never left I don't think he might not have left the UK and he'd certainly never travelled alone and at this point I had even aside from the fact I'd only done one sort of expedition thing before I'd, I'd traveled quite a lot within Europe by myself and and actually kind of all over the world a little bit so I, w I was much more experienced in that sense than him so I'm very brave on his part to sort of throw his lot in um it was a bit bonkers anyway he ended up pretty much saving my life in week two or three because we ran out of water um in the middle of the day I basically fainted and was waking up being sick uh completely um actually feeling very drunk you know completely had lost the ability to help myself um as i was at that sort of stage of heat sickness and he walked several kilometers on got to the next village and then managed to get water come back to me basically pour a load of water on me um they dragged me into the shade keep that going till it got dark and then we walked together to the next village um and i basically was just gone for like two days completely collapsed 
Um, so that was that was lucky. I had some, <laughs> lucky I had some with me, and I have I have learned, and it's it's um, it's something I always tell people when they when they're going to if people are asking for advice about about anything that's in a hot country. It's just so easy to happen. It sneaks up on you. It really does. Um, the same with hypothermia. It's those things that you're in a temperate environment like the UK, you're just not prepared for. And the things you don't even think about those, you know, those are the really dangerous things is you factor in, oh, you know, there's going to be snake bites or something potentially. So we'll take X or what happens if X, we'll take a radio, but what happens if, um, it's the stuff you don't uh, think about that you, that's really dangerous. And that was something I'd never considered even an issue before I set out, which is very stupid of me. Anyway. Yeah. Enough rambling on that. No, that's quite, that's quite the sort of story. I, I think when you pick a partner, we had Ian Finch on last week and he was saying that you've got to have the right goals when you go on a sort of expedition like that. You both have to have goals, either whether it's... And you've got to know what each other wants to achieve out of it. Otherwise, you could be staring down very different paths. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would. I would absolutely. Um, And I think it worked... I can't remember. I was reading this, but it, but the like if you if you absolutely nail your roles, and then you've got to. I also think be very careful of not stepping across that boundary. There's almost like an artificial politeness that comes into play on expeditions more so than in real life. Wherein, wherein um, you know, if someone's the photographer and someone's uh, X, the writer, perhaps, and the writer says, oh, there's a cool thing over there. I'll, I'll take, you know, I'll just grab his camera. He's not using it. I'll take a photo. Um, and this is not something that's ever happened to me, but it's something you, you start to notice the edges of. Um, and when you start stepping into other people's prescribed areas, it just creates stress. So you've got to be really careful that not only do you have, this is what you do, this is what I do, you know, you navigate. And I don't question your navigation because I'm not the navigator. Um, or, you know, and if, if there's a mistake, it's on you. So there's a flip side to that, you know, um, and of course, same with any, with any role. Um, but you do really have to lay down responsibility because that's what, that's one of the really interesting things about it. It's just they do teach responsibility, you know, especially a solo expedition, everything is on you, but you've got to maintain those responsibilities, that level of responsibility into other expeditions. You don't, you don't give someone like, a a role for the sake of giving them a role that you're not really going to trust them with. You've got to say, no, this is what you're doing. If you're the team leader or you're dividing up before because you're, you're, you don't necessarily need to have a team leader, but you, you're really strict on this is your role. This is my role. If they ask, if they say, oh, I'm busy photographing this quickly, take a video of that. That's fine. But it's when it's don't, you've got to be really careful in proportioning that. I don't know if I quite phrased that right. Um, but stuff that's worked really well is, is uh, my partner, Iris, you know, she's, She's a much more serious scientist than I am. And so she would always be, you know, absolute science lead. And I would always be photography and pretty much everything else. So, you know, in terms of camping, all that kind of setup, food, that sort of stuff, the logistical and let's say also the probably the, the media side, writing and photography. So, of course, I'm very happy for her to help on any of that. And she's very happy for me to help. But like, you've got those very clear delineations and it makes it much easier. But I think the other thing is in terms of picking, because I've been asked before, like, do I prefer um, like solo versus team stuff? I say the problem with solo is you can really push yourself at home or in familiar terrain, let's say, if you're an experienced mountaineer, you can really push yourself solo or experienced kayak or whatever. Um, but when you're in a new environment, it doesn't matter how you, good you are, you know, stuff goes wrong if you don't know the terrain. And so it's, re- you know, the biggest safety aspect you can have is a partner, you know, way better than a radio or tracking beacon or the best med kit in the world is having a partner. Uh, so it allows you to push yourself. So I, I'm really in favor of at least having one other person, preferably two, you know, on a team. I'm, I much prefer teams. And I also think if you find the right person, you get someone who pushes you into the areas you're uncomfortable, but they're comfortable and you push them in the same way. So perhaps, you know, okay, the, the most silly version of that would be someone's a bit scared of heights and someone's a bit scared of the dark, you know, so someone's saying, okay, we're going to walk through the night and someone's saying, oh, and we're going to go, you know, we're going to climb this bit or whatever. And that was, a, you know, that's a completely flippant made up example. But um, you, I think you get what I mean in that 
you know, if someone's saying, no, we're going to, you know, we're going to really push to get this, this particular biological objective, this particular, you know, absolutely making sure you nail the, uh, let's say the data collection, and someone is absolutely making sure you nail the, the safety and the, you know, the logistical side of it. And, you know, you're both absolutely on it and pushing it further than it would have been gone, uh, it would have gone if you had been an individual. So it's really, really important, that sort of complementariness. You don't necessarily want to pick someone who's exactly the same as you. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I've, I've done a few trips with other people. And as I said, as you've, we've sort of covered, it's so important to have those roles. And on the trips, luckily, you know, they're amazing at logistics. Usually when I go on my own, I'm just free will it's just you know no map just cycle and see where it takes you or walk or run and you know just look on google and go okay down there but when it's you know when it involves visas and logistical know-how or this you know that's them and they were pro and it sort of seemed to work really really well and of course you have that i don't know sometimes you have those little frictions here and there but because you have your certain roles as you said, it you can sort of manage it. So do you think um, when you did your trip in Sumatra with Iris, so sort of talking about sort of logistical nightmares, you had quite a tricky time in Sumatra. Is that right? right. Yeah, Sumatra was, Sumatra was interesting. Indo- it's got, by the way, heads up, you know, Indonesia as of 2019 has made it a hell of a lot harder to do anything there. They brought in very strict uh, rules around visas. And if you're breaching, you know, if they think you're nudging across from being, uh, let's say, a tourist to being a journalist, then you can end up with like genuinely years in prison. And they're not messing around with it. Like uh, the Indonesian government's pretty hardcore. Um, It's getting, well, it's almost regressing now, but hardcore is a bit of an understatement. And they they yeah you can really fall afoul of it and bbc journalists and that geo uh people have, have fallen you know you don't have the permit for this specific area you're going to prison i think there are there are still bbc uh linked journalists in prison in, in indonesia uh so it's it's really something to be careful of and it's become a lot more uh, potentially dangerous since we were there um when we were there it wasn't even a particularly undangerous time <laughs> but, the, but um yeah so we, we were looking at trying to do a, a biodiversity survey in Sumatra and we got in contact with a friend of a friend of a friend, someone who'd done, someone who'd got an Nat Geo grant to go and cover some of the restoration work after the 2004 tsunami. So they knew a lot of people at the university out in Aceh, which is effectively think of it in terms of both independence, past history, or that how uh, as sort of the Scotland of Sumatra and Sumatra is one of the Indonesian islands. And actually just for a bit of quick context, Sumatra and all of the Indonesian islands are were not historically united. They, uh, the Dutch owned them, and when the Dutch left in the 60s, I think it was maybe 1960 actually, uh, Java effectively seized control. And that doesn't sit well with a lot of the outerlying islands, particularly the ones like Sumatra, which were historically very rich and independent and uh you know potentially different religions and all this kind of stuff so it, it it's almost almost can be seen as a, an empire owned by java up to a, up to a point um and it's a, that's a bit a bit of a wrong statement it depends kind of which island you're on but sumatra has got a bit of a uh, independent streak and Aceh in particular had been fighting a sort of ongoing civil war for about 30 years which had ended basically with and because of the tsunami. Uh, the 2004 tsunami hit closest point of land was Aceh and it it absolutely devastated the coast there. And so hundreds, I think 100,000 people almost died in Aceh alone. Um, so they had to uh, accept relief efforts, which meant they had to effectively end the civil war. Um, so good thing or a bad thing, depending on who you ask. Uh, so it was, it was an interesting time to go there. Sort of terrorism had been fairly ongoing up until sort of, late 2010 sort of time so we were going 2016 so sort of been quiet for about five or six years but so we eventually found someone uh we got good contacts we got contacts with the university professors out in Aceh and um there was some fascinating stuff so Aceh's amazing rainforest and it's also some of the fastest deforested in the world you can look at a map of Sumatra sort of the last 20 years I literally meet from 2000 to 2020 and it's like someone's got on a razor and just rubbed out the rainforest going up the country 
a country the size of the UK, you know, just go from 90% forest to about 10% forest. So it's really quite upsetting, um, especially as they have some of the most amazing megafauna. It's one of the only countries, I think it is the only country in the world where you've got, you've got a great ape, you've got the orangutan, you've got elephants, you've got rhinoceroses, you've got tigers, you know, and you've got gibbons as well. So you've got all these amazing uh, species living, you know, in the same ecosystem. And uh, so we eventually got hold of the, this uh, guy and it, he was suggesting we go to this, this valley that's 40 kilometers long in the middle of very inaccessible forest cordoned off on each side by like, I think 4,000 meter mountains, so 3,000 meter mountains. So very inaccessible to get in. And then this 40 kilometer long valley. And I, I was actually saying earlier that we were, that uh, like they, we were very naive initially in, in the timings of how long this would take. Cause I was, you know, last thing I'd done was walking India when you could quite easily do 40 kilometers in a day. So I was thinking, you know, what's this two days walk. And uh, so, well, you need more like a month. And actually it turned out that when we did go to actually a separate place at Peyton Ashe, our record was basically walking dawn till well into the night. So I don't know what, 14, 15 hours on, on our feet and covering about 2.5 kilometers as the crow's flies because you know, it's mountain forest. So it's like, it's like this steep footpath, you're practically climbing, you're climbing through something that's pretty, you know, let's say a bramble hedge is probably the closest thing you could get in the UK. It's uh, stuff called rattan. It's what you make uh, that sort of quaint furniture out of, but in the wild, it's covered in spikes about this long. It just weaves through itself and it loves mud. So if there's rat on, rattan thicket, there tends to be a lot, of, a lot of mud as well. So mud and spikes and steep slopes um, are good fun. And um, anyway, so we, we were like, okay, we'll, we'll try and do this. And we tried to get permits. We emailed absolutely everyone, you know, every uh, forest department and wildlife, you know, station there was um, to, to, to try and get into this place. And eventually we had to fly out without permits. And we ended up, uh, we, we were in contact with a few people. So we, we were sort of, we were going to meet people, we weren't going completely blind. And after about five, six days, we met the, we met, uh, when we landed, we met um, a couple of guys we've been in touch with who are uh, very cool. They're a couple of Sumatra mountaineers called Said and Roy, and together they're trying to make a hundred first ascents in Sumatra, which I think gives you an idea of the number of first ascents there are to be made in Sumatra. And they're serious mountains; they're three thousand plus uh, meter mountains. Um, and I think they made over fourteen or fifteen first ascents between them, and already, and they they were really keen to help us. And so we, and they were obviously. Indonesian, they were Achenese actually, and they were really helpful in trying to get permits and, you know, going to the police and all this kind of stuff. And eventually we just got completely shut down. Uh, it was just red tape after red tape, you know, we were being told you had to take a police officer with you and you had to take X number of government officials with you and all this. And it was, you know, with all of the will in the world, you don't want to take people who don't want to be there and don't like you into a dangerous environment on a potentially dangerous expedition. So um, we ended up saying absolutely not. And we sort of found out later that potentially that forest had been um, logged, that valley had been logged, which is a shame because the reason we were really interested in going there, when I say a shame, I mean a tragedy, um, because the reason we'd been interested in going there and the reason this guy had suggested he was an orangutan expert. And in 2017, the same professor was actually uh, instrumental in finding, identifying a new popular new species of orangutan. So Sumatra previously was thought to be home to the Sumatran orangutan, which is a critically endangered species. And it turned out that a population of about 100 of those weren't Sumatran orangutans at all. They were a different species that had been isolated, I think, after the last ice age, and were, were a completely different species. And they were the newest, they are the newest ape species and also the, the most endangered ape species today. Great, great ape. And uh, they were potentially in that valley, and that valley has uh, potentially been uh, completely logged. So we had to fairly quickly you know, within days, come up with a new objective. And uh, luckily, because we linked up with these with these two mountaineers, Roy and Said, they had an objective in mind, which was this unclimbed mountain, uh, Mount Kurok, 3,050 meters up in the middle of Aceh. But what's so interesting about that is it's actually in the middle of some vast area of intact forest, you know, unimaginable when you grow up in the UK, um, hundreds of square kilometers. And that's completely intact and it's intact because it's in mountains. So the, the forest starts at about 1,600 meters, but the forest proper, proper intact forest is at about 2,000 meters plus. But luckily it's sort of not a plateau, but it's mountain from 2,000 meters to 3,000 meters sort of just undulating across with covered in, covered in forest. And it's, it, the reason it's been protected is just impossible to get logging machinery and it would be useless for growing uh, palm oil or that, all that sort of stuff. So we decided to go there with, with the aim that uh, we couldn't find any research in this area previously. And that's another amazing thing about Sumatra. It's very underfunded. 
for conservation. So there are large, and it's vast. So you've got vast, you've got not much money, vast areas, and the, the funding therefore tends to go to uh, to small points, you know, to pockets known to be biodiverse, to, to uh, let's say to reserves that already exist. So there's a lot of area that is almost certainly bursting with life, but there's just not the money spare to go and conduct research in those places. So we were very lucky to be the first people going to conduct a biodiversity survey of any sort within this forest. And, you know, Mount Kirk being unclimbed also meant that it was not researched either. Um, and that was that. And we eventually got permits to go there. And it was much easier to get permits there because it's not protected, which at the same point was quite worrying uh, because we were really unsure what we we're going to find. And actually on the first day, uh, hiking out, the first people we met were hunters who'd been who'd been shooting in the forest and had caught some beautiful birds, who I'm not criticising at all because I think that's very important to draw lines between people who are hunters and people who are poachers. And they were definitely hunters, you know, just coming from the village, just, you know, a, a relationship with the forest rather than extractive or destruction of the forest. And um, and like I say, that was brutal hiking. Just to get to Mount Kirk was like two weeks of some of the worst, that, well, not the worst, uh, the most brutal hiking you've ever done. And I think the the thing you don't think about when you think of a, a, a beautiful forest is you don't see the forest. You see the trees and you see you see several meters in front of you of moss and and rotting tree trunk and all this kind of stuff that you don't that you don't quite picture. And it was pretty much after, you know, after the first week, I think we got onto a ridge where we could see across the forest. And I took some photos there, which the photos I always use for any speech <laughs> where you've got rolling forest going to the distance. But it wasn't like that at all. I mean, most of the time you're sort of almost crawling on hands and knees. And then, of course, when we got to Kirk and tried to climb Kirk, we had 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 some beautiful views as well. Um, but the maps we had were awful, like properly, you know, they were taken from uh, plane mapping. Uh, so completely wrong scale for walking on foot. And uh, we got to the base of Kurik at about 2,500 metres, expecting a ridge line that would be followable. And actually what we had was a series of cliffs, about 90 metre cliffs, another ledge, cliff, ledge. And when I say cliff, I mean like choss and moss and roots coming out, you know, falling off in your hands, no way you could... Uh, attempt it without some fairly serious planning and serious care and there's no not like there's any rescue option there so it was uh something we backed off with but we actually climbed uh, mount lombu which is in the same massif it's just next door um almost the same height and we were the well the second team up we we when we got to the top we were we found this little concrete pillar about this big you know one bag of concrete and uh a dutch team had been there in 19, off the top of my head, I might be wrong, 1936, it was 1930s. And they'd all written their names under there and smashed a beer bottle. And you were just, you know, completely bonkers. Because we didn't even know this, this was up there. And you'd, how these guys had done it. I, they, we think they must have been part of some sort of survey survey team. Um, you know, the last people standing on that man. It was always more interesting than, I think, actually was more interesting than being on an unclimbed mountain. I'm not a big unclimbed mountain guy. So... To suddenly go up there and just think, you know, the last people standing here it was almost a hundred years ago, and they were in an era completely, you know, in colonial Indonesia, owned by the Dutch, forced. You know, I don't think they particularly enjoyed hiking all the way out here. Uh, the Dutch invasion was was fought back against brutally. You know, the Achenese, uh gave pretty good. I think the the famous story is the first day the uh, the Dutch arrived in Aceh. Uh, I think the commander of the entire invasion force was shot by an Achenese sniper. So it was not a, you know, it was a proper war zone. It was not just a walk in and stick a flag kind of image of colonialism um, because the the, the the Achenese were being backed by the British. So they, they had guns. And so, yeah, I mean, it was a proper, oh, you know, free fall back in time moment. It's amazing. And uh, when you looked out, we could see, you know, to the horizon, unbroken forest, which I hope is something I will see again. It's the only time in my life I've ever seen it. Um, yeah, just like looking at a sea of forest and just hearing gibbons about a thousand meters below, calling up up the side of this forested mountain. It was like you know absolutely awe inspiring. And from there we walked to the coast, um, and and the whole way we were doing a biodiversity survey, which actually was got some amazing results. It was an incredibly biodiverse area. We found critically endangered Sumatran orangutans, uh, very endangered species of gibbon. Called a siamang. Uh, it's one. That, it's the biggest gibbon. It's a huge, black, beautiful animal, 
and uh, as well as some small cat species as well and, and a load of birds about 80 something birds species and for context we were actually in that area our focus survey area for about three days so you know 80 80 plus bird species in three days isn't bad going so it's absolutely absolutely mind-blowing wow what an absolute adventure really just had everything everything to it yeah <laughs> yeah i think that's that's the thing i've been always trying to do and still trying to do which is you know you gain experience slowly i couldn't have jumped in with that so it was you know each each expedition le leads to the next one and the skills come across you can't say from day one i'm going to do an ex an ambitious physical expedition um with a scientific objective because the scientific objective adds so much to the you know stopping every hour taking off your pack conducting a survey i know it sounds good to take off your pack but to take off your pack <laughs> get everything out not rest suddenly engage the mind suddenly be like okay we've got to be not making any mistakes now do that write it all down check it's all waterproof and packed away properly repack the bag put the bag you know those interruptions you can't just get into a plod you can't just get into the zoned out phase because you've got to be you know and the whole way you know you're anything opportune it's not just the surveys you're taking at fixed intervals you're also of course keeping your eye open for anything you know that that could feed into the, the your biodiversity data so you've got to be on it the whole time and it completely messes you and even someone like uh like iris who's who's now you know done some very very serious um scientific uh objective expeditions and really quite impressive field work she started by cycling across bolivia and uh that had no science to it at all but it definitely you know you can see that progress that you've got to know you can handle the the physical side of it the sleep deprivation side of it the food the logistical side of it before you then add in something more complicated on top of it like a scientific or a journalistic potentially uh potentially or you, or you dial back on the physical side of it and really up on things but it's they all they all tie in really nicely i i don't think there's i don't even object to uh to pure adventure because it does absolutely teach you a huge amount yeah i i agree i think um probably like every podcast we have on it's always about growth uh, facing adversity and it, i think it always helps in day-to-day -day life in in a sense through tragedy or whatever experiences you have by doing these adventures putting yourself through hardship i think only makes you stronger in the long term, long term. yeah i mean i think for me um and yeah I, I think i think one of the things from that is it's not just i think people have this image i was actually going to go ramble off on a slight tangent uh because i occasionally get approached by companies to um to sort of like promote their kit and i tend not to i, I don't super like it unless i unless i've used their stuff and you tend to get a thing where uh you know can you look quite serious in this shot sort of thing you know they want you to sort of look out into the distance looking sort of frowning and I think a company that gets it right is something like Patagonia, where everyone's always got a massive grin on their faces because people who do adventures and expeditions tend not to take themselves too seriously and tend to be, you know, <laughs> it's a very, it's a very sort of stereotype from, I don't know, James Bond's films that you've always got to be sort of frowning and looking very serious. But what I was going to say was, before I jumped off on that slightly um, weird uh, tangent, was that it's not just dealing with stuff with a frown on your face. You've got to be being positive. If you're in a team, you can't be, this is rough and I'm going to sit sullenly in a corner. You've got to be, especially for the team leader, you know, you've got to be getting everyone else happy, motivated. You've got to be very emotive. You've got to be keeping, you've got to be knowing, you know, are they being quiet because they're just humming a song in their head or are they being quiet because something's going wrong with their foot? Is there, is there do we need to be doing some sort of early, you know, quick treatment on that? Are they developing a blister? Are they in pain? Are they feeling sick? Are they angry do they think we've made a mistake you know you've got to be in touch with that and able to communicate that and able to handle that and also able to give people space so you've got to be really on it that's a but particularly in terms of the people you're meeting because you are going into a country it's not your country you're potentially having some very strange encounters where you're basically just walking into someone's village in the middle of nowhere you know imagine i don't know what the equivalent would be but you know suddenly a massive you know i'm six foot four white guy walking into a walking into a village of uh some you know smartron uh people who happen to be about five foot four just minding their own business in a paddy field it's a bit bonkers and you've got to be there not you know you might be feeling shit i might have been walking all day and all night and 
be very hungry and really be in a horrible mood, but you've just effectively invaded someone's back garden. You've got to be absolutely prepared to have a massive smile on that, your face and uh, shake everyone's hand and be really, really friendly and hugely grateful for any help they give you and not care at all if they don't give you any help because it's completely their right not to. And, um, and you know, for caveat, Sumatra was by far the friendliest country I've ever been to every single night that we were, once we left the forest and we were walking through rural areas, because we were also comparing, we were doing a comparative survey of, of different landscape types all the way through to sort of monoculture with this pristine rainforest. It was one of the sort of things we were doing. Um, we, every single night, we were invited back to someone's home. You know, sometimes it was awkward because you were invited back to three or four people's homes and you had to sort of make a choice. <laughs> so, really sorry, but he asked first. And, you know, uh, so it was a bit bonkers, but they, so absolutely incredibly friendly. And, um, but you know, in India, you know, which is obviously a very populous country, we were meeting, ten, you know, met tens of thousands of people, sometimes about hundreds of people a day, uh, possibly, you know, that you would actually talk to, hundreds of people a day. And it can be exhausting because everyone's asking the same question, you know, where are you from? Where have you come from? What are you doing? You know, why are you doing that? And for you, it's the thousandth time you've been asked that. For them, it's the first time they've met someone. It might be the first time, you know, for, for kids, it will probably be in the r rural areas of India, it's going to be the first time they've met someone who looks like you. Um, and you've got to remember that and every single and you know every single interaction you've got to have you've got to be polite you've got to be smiling you've got to be positive um so it's 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 not just dealing with adversity it's dealing with adversity whilst maintaining empathy and being outwardly at least very positive even if you <laughs> even if you're gone inside you know so it's i think it is it's a proper lesson in that it's a proper lesson in that yeah i agree sort of negativity on an expedition especially if you're going with someone and they're complaining and negative it, it brings the whole trip down and so if if one can just avoid that and have a big smile i think it's quite funny how you're saying with um clothing brands to sort of look serious look left look serious look right right <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah um, um but yeah it's it's it, I think it's really important to always have a smile. And as you say, it's the first time you're meeting them. It's always good to give a good impression. Well, Oli, there's a part of the show where we ask the five same questions to each guest each week. We, with, with the first being, on your expeditions, what's the one gadget or that you always take with you? I, yeah, I should, I should probably give a better answer because gadget, I mean, gadget's boring. Gadget, I always had camera. I mean, I'm a, I am work occasionally semi-professionally, at least as a photographer. So I've got to have a camera on me. I take a camera over a phone. Obviously, I always take both. Um, the thing that's been slightly, I guess, slightly unexpected that has ended up on every single one of my expeditions is at some point I went into TK Maxx and got an absolutely amazing deal on like a merino wool long sleeve base layer, core zip thing. And it's now so scruffy. And I used it initially for running and it's ended up because if you go to a hot country, it's your warm layer. You know, it packs up like this. So you wear, you, you know, you're wearing a light T-shirt and you put that on in the evenings and that's you done. So India and Sumatra is my warm layer. And uh, if you go to a cold country, if, you know, I was, I was photographing in Iceland uh, last, what well, last December gone, you know, pre-COVID, I've completely lost track of when it was. Um, you know, it's your base layer. So it's ended up on everything, cold or hot or in between, it's ended up coming. So it's things like that I really like. Um, and I really like to try and be non-specific, think about what I can use for many different things. So I don't like to buy um, a piece of kit that's exclusive to a particular, you know, if you can buy something that you can also use under your dry suit kayaking, you can wear after a surf and you can wear as your belay jacket climbing and also is super useful for an expedition because you've thought ahead and thought, okay, for an expedition, it's going to take a lot of abuse. So probably, you know, I'll go for the slightly more durable one or I'll go for the one that dries a bit quicker or XX. Just always trying to think through uh, maximal range of uses. I think, you know, people can get so tied down to what's the, what's the light. I'm obsessed with weight in terms of, you know, what's the lightest kit, minimal kit I can take, but I'm not necessarily obsessed on the, on the individual thing being the best. So it's, I, I much prefer something that, that does a bit of everything that applies to a lot of different stuff. And I know I'll be able to use till it absolutely is uh, gone. Yeah. What about your favorite adventure or travel book? Um, 
I think anything, I don't know if you've heard the author Norman Lewis. So Norman Lewis, um, he died in like 2003 or something in his late 90s. And he was a Welsh uh, writer who, I guess he was born probably in the 20s. And he, well, he was in the Second World War, as everyone was. And he was with the Americans in Italy and then he was all over the world you know uh, Vietnam War by which I mean the French War in Vietnam pre the American War and then the American War in Vietnam and you know, and yeah everywhere around the world India all these places have and he was at a really bloody awful time in history I think you know we think oh god you know now's bad now's bad for a lot of reasons of course um, but you know this is the end of colonialism a lot of brutal wars you know, Cold Wars peaking up on the horizon. You know, that, that period of history when he was very active was properly awful for a lot of people. And he was an incredibly human writer. He absolutely didn't take sides, absolutely told it how he is. He's very good at not one of the not someone who goes, and this was bad, and I thought about it this way, and it made me feel this. Just writes what happens. You know, so very good way of building trust i think it's very good journalistic style that he just uh you you absolutely see him as a witness who just tells it like it is and doesn't interpret it um and you know it, it doesn't matter that he's with the british he will absolutely criticize the british or the americans or you know etc i mean there's some really harrowing stuff in there and um he wrote a lot of books some are beautiful some are deeply uh potentially dark um uh but there's a whole range and i think one you know for, i first book i read was by him was in sumatra i read empire of the east which is him in his 80s late 80s he traveled around indonesia uh during the Ateni civil war um and just you know transformed the way you see the country i think it's really important to read up on the history and the culture and the context of the country you go to um you know so, you know, I, I was in Ethiopia a couple of years ago and knew almost nothing about the any of the conflicts that had been going on over the, over the last decades until just before I went. And you're sort of like, oh, bloody hell, all this makes sense. The sort of stuff that you go to country, oh, that's a bit odd. And actually there is a very real and relevant meaning to it. Um, and there's all this stuff. And you, it's very important not to be completely naive to that. If you can help it, obviously some folks can't help it. Um, so, yeah, anything, anything by Norman Lewis is brilliant was the conclusion to that rant. <laughs> um, why are adventures important to you? Uh, uh, yeah, I guess. So right now, because, because they are ways of doing things, by which I mean there is a difference for me between my early stuff, which was like adventure for the sake of adventure, and now I'm always looking for is you know my, my day job is is effectively uh, writing uh, about ecological environmental issues and so i it's always sort of you know can you use an expedition to highlight something and i think you can incredibly effectively um and can you can you use it to investigate something can you, you know can you even if you're not a scientist or you're not an archaeologist or you're not x um can you draw attention to an issue or can you find you know if you're a team leader if you're someone who can handle all the logistical and physical side of it, can you find an uh, archaeologist or an anthropologist or a uh, biologist or local, you know, especially local, especially in country, who wants to come along and otherwise wouldn't have, have had that opportunity, especially if someone's in country. That's the really interesting thing, because then, especially if you can get the budgets right, you can basically bring someone along for no extra cost if their flights aren't an issue, you know, if they're, if they're actually smart, you know, you say, well, do you want to tag along? Do you want to, you know, do you want to do some biodiversity field work have you got a project in mind can we talk to someone who would have a project in mind and it's really easy to facilitate that so facilitation or uh, a key objective so for me it is kind of objective based is what i'm saying um but then on the other hand for me it is also just fun and <laughs> it's something it's just a bug isn't it like for for anything even if i do in the uk if you're going to see kayaking i'd much rather kite down the coast for a week than kite down the coast for four hours and i guess that does count as an adventure so um, and that's just about getting out of the day-to-day -day routine and getting a bit, you know, it takes a while. I think it takes about three days for your, for me, it's always my, for what feels like my vision to really lock in and your headspace to clear. Like it, it takes days, not hours, I think, to really feel like you're, you're out.
you're outdoors. So I think that's why it's important to do those sort of longer journeys. Very nice. What about your favorite quote? Um, <laughs> oh, give me a second. I didn't plan on these. Um, Chaucer. What did Chaucer say? Chaucer said, ah, I've got one for you. Yeah. Life is short. Life is short. So obviously the most overused and obvious quote ever. And it's actually, it is actually not as you would imagine, something that popped up in the 90s on crappy t-shirts and Facebook, it was actually by Chaucer and it was written about seven, eight hundred years ago, what, 12th century, 13th century. And the full quote is actually quite a bit longer. It is, if I can remember off the top of my head, uh, life is short, opportunity is fleeting, judgment is difficult. I think, I think that's the full thing. And one, I just love that that it's that old and it's maintained and it's just still applicable and i think the whole quote is so much more interesting life is short opportunity fleeting that's it life is short art is long opportunity is fleeting and judgment is difficult um and it's very true <laughs> very nice when you said cliche i was like he's gonna come with it's not the destination it's the journey <laughs> <laughs> i was like he's gonna reel that one off isn't he <laughs> Yeah. Um, people listening are always keen to travel and go on these sort of grand adventures. What's the one thing you would recommend for people wanting to get started? Um, yeah, something I always need to remind myself of. So especially, I mean, I could show you an Excel spreadsheet, which has got every single grant I've applied to this year. And obviously it's been a very rough year for applying to funding. And even actually, obviously partners of PhD, you know, with a lot of experience as well. And, and has, it's hit, we both hit a lot of walls on funding and all this kind of stuff. And these, you know, any sort of travel restrictions have, have shut a lot of stuff down. So don't, even if you're going to go big and ambitious, have a backup plan, which is minimal. You can do yourself and you can fund yourself. Um, and by fund yourself, I mean, you can do stuff very cheaply. Norway was, like I say, about 400. And I think India was under a few hundred and a few yeah, there's lots more things you, you, there's amazing stuff you could do uh in europe especially in uh places like romania and bulgaria you know incredibly wild places and absolutely amazing even poland you know get there for no no money it's very cheap to be there and yeah so have have a backup plan or have your primary plan be something that you don't need permission to do you don't need uh a lot of you don't need to wade through red tape you don't need to wade through grant applications to and if you want to do all of that and really go big, fine, but be prepared that if you fail, you're not going to have completely failed because you've got plan B and plan B or plan C maybe is the one that you can absolutely just do. You could walk out the door today and do it. So if you want to do a big bonkers cycle or a scientific objective or, you know, anything or a, or a journalistic project, whatever it might be, have, have a project that you can do yourself. Amazing. Um, finally, what are you doing now and how can people follow your adventures in the future? Pre-COVID, pre I was planning to be, uh, last year actually, to have kayaked from uh, mid-Alaska, down Alaska, down the west coast of Alaska and then down, down Canada sea kayaking. Um, it's take about four months. And uh, I was, <laughs> was going to do that with my dad because he's just retired. He'd retired like, just, just before COVID. Um, so that was sort of our, our plan because we've always... I grew up sea kayaking and obviously that was gone but we've rescheduled that and hopefully that'll happen in 20, uh, 20, oh, what are we, 2022 because uh, you've got to do it in the summer so there's no chance you can do that in the winter Alaska is a chilly place and I was also I'm also I've been putting a lot of effort into trying to get funding for uh, a return to Sumatra so the area I was in in Sumatra is now sadly in the sort of four years since I've uh, was there is now the largest remaining area of intact forest outside of a reserve in Sumatra and it still hasn't had a proper intensive survey like I say we we're actually only at the Kurik Massif for like three days and I want to go back and do a a proper intensive by which a survey by which I mean you know camera traps in the field for best part of a year really uh, because that's how you find very rare species that's how you find you know the, the the stuff that's very elusive will avoid people you know things like uh, tigers um, which are possibly you know they're in that ecoregion so that's that's sort of my 
big ambition right, right now and it would be bonkers you we would, we would require repeat expeditions in um over over a period of about a year so it's a bit bonkers bit ambitious really interesting we've got an awesome archer team apart from myself um and then iris as a as a advisor but not not on the field team so it'd be really really cool and uh, smart students as well so absolutely fantastic and i'd be really keen to get that working and then um sort of you know in, in terms of stuff i can do and i can fund i've got um a project actually like i was saying in um uh just above greece and it's uh going to greece and it's uh a river that i'm really interested in going to i've i'm really i've i grew up free drive free diving and um I've always sort of wanted to go. I, I free dive quite a lot in rivers as well as in uh, in the sea, but obviously Cornwall's quite narrow, and we don't get very long, beautiful rivers, and we certainly don't get, you know, uh, that we you know, we're so bad in the UK with like pollutants and stuff like that in our in our water, and it's a lot of very bad visibility usually in rivers. So to go somewhere with a pristine, undammed river, intact river ecosystem, intact delta system, and just drift down effectively uh with a with a camera <laughs> and uh, over a couple of weeks and a, and a little duffel bag with all my bivy kit in um i've really interested to there's a couple of rivers i've got on my eye on because they've uh there's a few there's quite a lot of you know controversy around some damning projects and a few other projects going on so there's, there's a little bit of a journalistic angle uh on that but you know selfishly it's obviously something i would absolutely love to do from a, an experiential point of view <laughs> so yeah to go to go and uh, free dive down a river um but yeah so to follow me i mean i'm on instagram uh oli ollie broadhead and um yeah my website is probably probably the best place um i've been being a bit lax i think many of us have uh taken a bit of a step back from social media i think over you know i certainly have i've been one of the people who sort of like deleting it intermittently then occasionally logging back on um which i think has been probably worth doing anyway <laughs> So yeah, as things progress, um, so oh, and and uh, hopefully trying to keep it very low ambitious. Um, hopefully going off to kite around the Isle of Skye fairly soon once things open up and everything becomes safe to do, self-supported, obviously. Uh, so not not hopefully not putting anyone else at risk. Um, but you know, as as lockdown permits and no no time frame on that, but sort of as soon as possible because I'm getting sort of itchy feet to. <laughs> to get out i'm sure we all are yeah we all are yeah I, th I think we all are and yeah with the instagram you always need a quick digital detox here and there get out into nature but ollie thank you so much for coming on today it's been absolutely fascinating hearing your stories of which you have way more than i was ever expecting <laughs> <laughs> good at rambling <laughs> Um, and yeah, do go check out his website. You, you're a very, very talented photographer. Take some beautiful pictures. And um, I'll be following your little sea kayak in the sky when everything opens. Yeah, that's brilliant. All right, cheers. <laughs> well, that is it for today. Thank you so much for listening. And I hope you got something out of it. If you did, hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you in the next video.